Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not know what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that as we come before you, that you have promised to attend your word by your Spirit, that your word is living and active. And so, Father, we ask that you would make us mindful of that, that we would see and know, that we would taste and see that you are good, and that we would understand one with another that your word is true and your word is life. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul was addressing the Galatians, he was addressing something that we also are in need of being addressed this morning. I don't necessarily say this as uh, New Hope Church. Maybe uh, it is a part of of us uh, by and large. But I say this more as a context in which we now live in 21st century America in the name of Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to live a Christian life? Many of you have co-workers, or many of you have family members, or, or previous co-workers, that they would say, yes, I am a Christian. But if you press them, why are you a Christian, or how are you a Christian, or what does that mean that you are a Christian, that some would say, well, it's about living the way that Jesus lived. It's about being a good, moral, upstanding person. It's about not necessarily holding that the things of Scripture are true, but that the kind of the general purpose that Scripture holds out is true. Now, these are are not biblical responses, but they are present in our reality. There are, are approaches to what it means to live the Christian life that are against Scripture. Approaches that are, are held, approaches that are perhaps even held out to the vast majority of people in our culture by way of social media, of it being uh, proclaimed, that this is what all Christians believe, or this is what all Christians should do, or this is how all Christians should live, and uh, we, should not, we should not focus on things that, that are unworthy to be focused on. But Paul, to the church in Galatia, And as the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and minds, calls us to truly understand what does it mean to live the Christian life? What does it mean as we approach a Christian life? And and Paul, uh, addressing again the the, the specifics in Galatia that are not going to map perfectly onto our setting today, but are important for us to hear, Paul encourages, challenges with some pretty strong language to the church, to say, this is not how you should live. 
Now, the church in Galatia had some issues, as all churches do. There is no perfect congregation. There is no perfect church, whether local or denominational. And so Paul's addressing them as he enters into the beginning of the letter to them. He calls them to task. He calls them to remember the gospel that had been given to you first by me. In fact, if anybody comes, another spirit, another apostle, if I myself come to you and tell you something different than what I told you at first, then they should be cursed. They should be anathema. There's one gospel, and it is never to be deviated from. It is not a gospel that can change with the whims of time. It's not a gospel that will ever decrease. It is a gospel that stands. And so Paul is encouraging them. He's pointing out to them the trouble that they specifically were falling into, and that was returning to the matters of the law. That as this church was, was growing and understanding what grace was and the gospel was, that they were also being inundated by people coming from Jerusalem, coming from other parts that were holding on to the belief that you had to follow through all the things of the Mosaic Law. In fact, it got so bad that Paul had to confront Peter himself at times. This was prevalent, not just in Galatia, but everywhere. And so Paul presents to the church in Galatia a stark difference between the law and the gospel. And so he works that out and, 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 and fleshes that out a little bit. He also, in, in here, uh, as we've heard, uh, some of your translations uh, don't say the uh, sinful nature, and some of them say flesh. Well, it, it's one word, and it means flesh. And so the, the NIV here is, is kind of giving us a, a, an interpretation of what that flesh is because this word flesh is uh, for other, uh, can be used for other just physical bodies. But here we're talking about what is opposed to the Spirit. And that's what we'll focus on this morning. But what we, need, what we need to understand is that Christ came into the world to redeem sinners. And that redemption is not by work, our work. We need to understand that Christ came into the world to redeem sinners, and that is not by our works. So, as, as uh, Paul uh, starts this letter out in, in chapter 1, if you want to look back with me, in verse uh, 6 of chapter 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to by who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul is orienting this church is orienting us as we step into this passage that we don't just uh, take this out of context and just start applying it indiscriminately according to whatever we might think comes into our mind. That we say, oh, the fruit of the Spirit, and I know what love is, and I know what joy is, and I know what patience is, and I know exactly what I should do, and I'm just going to go do it. But we need to understand it in terms of context of what the gospel is, of the ways that we can get the gospel so wrong as Paul is charging the Galatians that they are actually perverting the gospel, that what is being uh, presented to them is that the gospel of Christ is being perverted. It's being altered. It's being twisted in so many ways that it's ceasing to be the gospel any longer. So what does it mean? Why, why is this all here? Well, uh, for our purposes this morning, as we look at this, we're looking at... Uh, um, life, Christian life, because we have the indwelling Spirit. That all those who believe ha do so because the Spirit of Christ has come and opened your eyes. That He has regenerated you. That you profess Christ where before you would not profess Christ. In our own strength, in our own ways, we are dead. In our trespasses and sins, Scripture says, we are dead. And so, by God's work through the Spirit, we are regenerated. 
we are born again into a new and living way, Paul says. And so here we see what does it mean to live a Christian life? What does it mean to be godly? Now, maybe we don't think of it in those terms very often. We think, well, there's the Christian life of what we're supposed to do. I have a certain amount of check boxes uh, that I'm going to check. I do this check, I do this check, I do this check. I am doing my thing. But the reality is that God calls us to be holy like he is holy. He calls us to godliness, and that is not a box that we can check. That's not a box that we can say, yep, I've done that now, I've accomplished that. So what does it mean to be godly? What does it mean for the redeemed of the Lord to live godly lives? And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We need to understand uh, this this, uh, godliness. We need to understand what this life in the Spirit is like. And then, um, by way of introduction this morning with that, then we can go on. Uh, and look more closely at what the fruit of the Spirit really is as it works uh, itself out in the life of the body. So this morning we're going to look at three aspects of, of godliness this morning. The pathway to godliness, the battle for godliness, and the key to godliness. And we'll be primarily looking just at the first uh, three verses here. So first, let's look at verse 16, the pathway to godliness. Paul has just finished telling them, here is what the command is that you should live in verse 14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Paul's calling the church to love. It's not a new command. It's not even a a terribly, um, maybe genius command. It's a basic command. It's the very mark that Jesus said, this is how people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. It's the very first fruit of the Spirit in the list that Paul gives. And so he says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we're tempted, like the, uh, the man in, in um, wanting to justify himself in Jesus' presence, we would say, who is my neighbor? And we would find that your neighbor is the one that you may least likely think of as your neighbor. But the love and the care is to be the same, as if it were your own flesh and blood. How much more so for the body of Christ? So as we look at this in verse 16, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. What we see here is a pathway to godliness. Paul is directing our attention. Again, this is not towards the direction of what does the law say? How can I fit into what God commands? How can I obey all the feasts and the festivals that Moses prescribed? How can I abide by everything? And how, how can I take very careful steps to go across, this, across all the lily pads of this pond so that I can stay on top of the water? That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying... Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, of the the flesh. The pathway to godliness is truly what he reiterates in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. That's the pathway to godliness. You, You cannot have the two together. You live by the Spirit, and there's no opportunity to gratify the desires of the flesh, of the sinful nature. Walk by the Spirit. This is the the pathway. Unbelievers don't have this option. Uh, Unbelievers, those who do not have the Spirit of God, only have one option. That's the That's to um, gratify the desires of the sinful nature. 
apart from Christ, apart from the Spirit of God regenerating you, your only option is that you would gratify your own sinful desires. Now, you would say, and rightly so, that there are people who do not want anything to do with Christ, and they're pretty kind people. That's fair. They're people that give to charity. They're people that help neighbors uh, with their trash can out to the road. They're people that are doing all manner of good things. But what we need to understand is where is that altruism coming from? What is the motivation of even those really good things that people are doing? The reality is it's self-love. The reality is it's all about me. It's how can I get something out of this? And maybe that's not on the surface. But for some who aren't believers, who are operating under the desires of the sinful nature, uh, they are not pursuing godliness. They're pursuing selfishness. Whether it's on the surface or whether it's deep down, there's an operation that says, I am doing this so that I can either alleviate my own guilt, so that people will think highly of me, so that I can tell other people that I've done this, so that I can get a nice tax return, so that I can uh, have people that would look at me and say, oh, what a great person he is, so that maybe I can put it on the imaginary and yet extremely horribly false notion that God's going to take all my good and it will outweigh all of my bad. The reality is that these are all sinful desires. They're actions of the flesh. There are those things that have been passed down to us because of the sin of Adam and Eve, that because of sin being in the world, that we do not desire the things of God. We desire the things of man even the best of things that we could pursue. could be very laudable actions, but they are still just sinful nature working itself out, the desires that we have and pursuing them. But the believer has another option. The Christian who has been regenerated, who has the indwelling spirit, has this call to live by the Spirit, that, that we would not gratify the desires, that we would be aware of what those desires are. Now, that means that on this pathway to godliness, we might actually have to do some work. That we may actually have to understand what are those things that so easily entangle us that, that uh, Hebrews chapter 12 calls us to? What, what are those things that we need to uh, put on uh, the altar, so to speak? What are those things that as a living sacrifice before God do not belong because sacrifices are presented pure and blameless? What are those things that we need to uh, strip away and not gratify? Are we aware of that? Are we aware of those things? It doesn't have to be really big things that we would, we would put a big S on as sin. Some of the most subtle ways that desires of our sinful nature come about in the quietness of our own heart. The truth is that there is nothing due from God on you but that he should let you perish in your sin. This is all he owes you. That's what Charles Spurgeon said. That's good enough for me. This is what God owes you. All he owes you is the punishment for your sin. Everything else is grace. The fact that he opens your eyes, the fact that he redeems you from the pit, the fact that he sets you on solid ground, the fact that he has promised you in Christ eternal life, that you've been adopted as sons, is nothing that you've done. It's all of grace. And so, Paul, in this same light, says, live by the Spirit. 
The pathway to godliness is focusing on the spirit and, and the, the things of God and not desiring or not gratifying the desires. What you will see, however, is that as you um, decrease gratifying the desires of your sinful nature, they won't go away completely, but they will diminish. Now, I don't know about um, how you feel about scientific studies, um, but there are various things that scientific studies say. There's increasingly an understanding that your gut actually determines what you eat. And that actually there are, because of the, the biochemical reactions and the things that are going on in your digestive system, that it actually prompts you to eat more sugar. That there's a desire that grows, and, and you don't know where that desire may be coming from. You just say, I just need something sweet. And the more that you indulge in that desire, the more that you gratify that desire, it doesn't go away. It just increases. You, you don't desire less sugar. You desire more sugar. Now, in some ways, that's, that's a, a reality of how God has made us. Our bodies have been designed to run on sugar. Not a ton of sugar, but to run sugar. It's not an evil thing to have sugar. But as you give in to the, and gratify that desire, you see more and more. Uh, and and what, what modern health and what modern science would tell us is that it causes a manner of other problems. But at the very least, by gratifying it, it doesn't go away. It only increases. And so, like gratifying the desires of the sinful nature, they don't go away. The desires of the flesh don't diminish. They only increase. The pathway to godliness is to not gratify. In fact, the word that Paul uses here as gratify, uh, teleo, is actually the same word that we use to, to, um, that gets translated as finishing. This, this is the the finishing end. This is the completion. This is the direction that will lead you to the fully formed object of what you're pursuing. So that if you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, those things that are drawing you further and further away from Christ. Again, they might not be big things. They might even seem like big things at the time. But we are mindful and need to be mindful that as James uh, writes to the church, this is James 1, 15, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The same word that James used that we translate as fully grown is the same word that we translate here as desire. This is, the, this is the end. This is the direction that the sinful desires are taking you. The sinful nature, the desires of the sinful nature are taking you. Desires themselves aren't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, the desires are what's going to prompt us, to, to move us. The same thing that's true about the desires of the sinful nature that will grow us in wanting more of the sinful nature is true about godliness. And so... The same, uh, I'm told at least, or as I read, uh, that as you decrease the amount of sugar and you change your diet, you actually start craving different things. Your desires actually change. Not completely go away of the others, but they change. This is the case with godliness. This is the case with living by the Spirit. The more that you live by the Spirit does not uh, take away completely the desires of the sinful nature, but it increases your desire, that God would be praised, that God would receive the glory, that God would be evident and visible. That's the pathway for, to godliness. But we also see here a battle that goes on, and Paul highlights that. This is the pathway, that living by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, but there's a battle that goes on. The battle for godliness is this, in verse 17. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. 
The presence of the Spirit does not mean that there's no longer sinful nature, that the flesh is not there anymore. In fact, what it means is that now there is a conflict. This is something also different with those who aren't believers. Believers don't have the same uh, conflict going on inside of them as believers do. They do not necessarily say, and they don't say in the same way as Paul, that I don't do the things that I want to do, and I do the things that I don't want to do. Now, unbelievers may say something sort of like that, but not in the context of godliness, not in the context of what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's selfish. It's inward-focused. This is the same sentiment that Paul himself goes on for a longer uh, discussion in Romans chapter 7. That this is who, and he ends with, who is going to rescue me from this? He says, thanks be to God. The battle for godliness is real, uh, and it's something that has been foreshadowed. In fact, uh, there's a good argument here um, that Paul is calling the Galatians who are really wanting to go back and run back to Moses' law, the law that was given to God through Moses at Mount Sinai, and that the people of Israel were commanded to live by, that these Galatians who are having a desire to return to that, that Paul is giving them the reality of the people of Israel then. Here's here's what I mean by that. The, The Galatians who are looking back to the law are just looking at the law. They're not looking at anything else. They're saying, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, then I will be good. I will have been justified, as Paul says earlier in this letter, I will have been justified by Christ, but now I'm going to be sanctified by the law. By me keeping the law, I am sanctifying myself. I am doing this good work. I am making myself fit for heaven. I am doing this because I'm obeying what God said, look at me and look at my fruit. And so Paul confronts that, and he uses the example of Hagar and Sarah, a child born uh, under sin and a child born under the promise. He uses the reality of those who, uh, those that came to uh, the, 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 uh, to the law of Moses to receive it, the covenant. But there's a foreshadowing that goes on here. When he says, live by the Spirit, and then uh, again in verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, you can look back and you can see what the people of Israel were doing. How did God bring the people up out of the land of Egypt? It was by the Spirit of God. God presented himself as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When the people of Israel disobeyed and they didn't trust in God to go into the promised land, what did God do? He said, this generation will not go in. But he was also gracious. And he led the people of God around for 40 years. Again, by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And Scripture tells us this is the Spirit of God who led them. The people of Israel were literally walking in step with the Spirit over and over again. When you read through um, Exodus, you see that the people of God stopped when the pillar stopped or the cloud stopped and they set up camp. When the cloud went up, and the pillar left. They picked up camp and they left. They were literally walking in step with the Spirit. They were also gratifying the desires of their sinful nature. And so Paul is is pointing us back to this foreshadowing of the people of, of Israel doing this, and now the people of God today are still commanded to walk and keep in step with the Spirit. Because we have not been fully glorified. In this life, we are called to see that there is one God, and it is his righteousness that is what we should pursue. It is one righteousness that we should seek, and one God that we should seek the glory of. 
and that God is not us. Now, the, the importance here in this battle is ultimately heart work. It's hard work as well, but it's heart work. Paul says in here, the spirit, the spirit, uh, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Now, the simple question with this is, where is the sinful nature? Where does the sinful nature reside? And we would say, in our hearts. Some, some cultures and, and, and some other uh, different languages would say something different. Uh, there was a time, and if you read some old English, you can get a little bit disconcerted because uh, you're, you're reading um, about how you can feel it in your bowels. That, that is a really, uh, that's a really good thing, actually. Uh, that, that's really where your heart in the seat of your emotions is. That's, that's the seat of who you are as a person, the bowels of a person. Now, we have a, a completely different view of that today. I don't know if we have any better view of it being in our heart, but that's, that's where we have it. We have an understanding that there is what makes you you in your own agency and in, in, in your own actions and in, in what you do being your heart. Now, what does that mean? What it means is to say that there is something unique about you. There's something that God has made you the way that he's made you in the way that you were born, in the experiences that you have had in life to this point. In the reality that God has again redeemed you and brought you from death to life. That he has called you his own, that he's, part, he's made you a part of the covenant community together with one another. These all mean something. And they are with and according to the Spirit of God. And they're contrary to the sinful desire. Everything in you that is sinful, everything that is passing away from this world is pushing you the opposite direction. So when the Spirit of God says, I've joined you together as a body, your sinful desire is to say, nope, I don't want any of that. I don't want to get too close to someone else. I don't want to get engaged with other people. I'm going to keep a distance. And yet, what Scripture says is you're going to be with these people for eternity. So, why not start now? The sinful desires are, are telling us that we can, we can uh, keep the things that are, are secret uh, in our own hearts, that we can engage in whatever we want to engage in. We can have the thoughts that we, we uh, dwell on, and we don't have to really do anything with them because they're just thoughts. They're not, I'm not acting on anything. When in reality, they're still the desires of the sinful nature. And Paul says those must be crucified with Christ. Those things are either sin or their righteousness. There's no middle ground. They're all, either the things of godliness or they're the things of sin. And so as Paul calls us here, he is calling us to the importance of hard work that we would not delude ourselves to think, well, I'm, I'm basically okay. I'm a Christian, and, and I'm, because I'm a Christian, I do pretty good things. No, that is a lie that Satan would want you to believe. It is not that you do pretty good things, and that is your sanctification. That is what you are, are all about. It is because you are clothed in Christ. It is because the Spirit of God is at work in you. It is not about the outward actions. Jesus was pretty clear about that when he said, it is the things that come out of the mouth that defile a person because they come from the heart. So there's an examination that needs to take place. Jonathan Edwards, um, old New England pastor, trying to think through uh, a great awakening that was occurring in his time, and trying to think through, uh, okay, I see these people doing these things and they're claiming really special things. What does it really mean 
to have uh, affection? What does it really mean to grow? You have these people that are going and doing all these things and claiming great uh, things. that they, they seem like they're really on fire for Christ, or at least they're on fire. Is everything just there? Is that, is that all true? And so in working this out, uh, it's, it's a longer work, but you'd be blessed, I think, by looking through it. Uh, he wrote uh, a treatise, a longer treatise, on the religious affections. And diving into somebody who seems like they're, they have an affection in, in religion, that they, that they really seem like they're growing, that they're on fire, is all of it equal? And he comes to the conclusion, no, it's not all equal. It's only by the grace of God, those things that are evident by grace. It's only those things that come from the truth of the word, not bringing a new truth to the word. Things that highlight the revelation of God, not a new revelation. But there's something that he says here that that helps us in this heart work that reminds us and, and challenges us. He writes this. The deceitfulness of the heart of man appears in no one thing so much as this of spiritual pride and self-righteousness. The subtlety of Satan appears in its height in his managing persons with respect to this sin. And perhaps one reason may be that, th- that here he has most experience. He knows the way of its coming in. He is acquainted with the secret springs of it. It was his own sin. Experience gives vast advantage in leading souls, either in good or evil. One of the most nefarious things that you can hold on to, a detriment to your own soul, is to harbor spiritual pride and self-righteousness. To say, I have figured it out. This is what I do. I do this. Maybe I'll tell other people, but maybe I won't. I'll, I'll probably tell people, but it'll be so that people can look up to me and see how good I am. That was the very sin of Satan. Taking pride in his own self-righteousness. So there's a battle for godliness, to be sure. But finally, there is a a key that we need to hold on to. There is a key that Paul then will lead us into leading the the argument as he's making to the Galatians, leading the conversation that we'll pick up uh, another time. But there's a key to godliness in verse 18. He turns back to the connection with the Spirit. He says, or he writes, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So what he's highlighting here, the the key, is that it's a Spirit-led life. Well, what does that mean? In one sense, that means you have freedom from the law. You have freedom from the law. You are not bound by the law. It is a relief to you that when you read the Ten Commandments, when you recite the Ten Commandments, that your justification and your sanctification is not bound on whether you are successful or fail at keeping those perfectly. You are called to it. You are called to righteousness. You are called to pursue it. You need to press hard on doing that. But your hope is not in whether you succeed or fail. Your hope is in the Christ who has succeeded. The Christ who never failed. The Christ who never will fail. The Christ who is working in you righteousness. His own not yours, who has given freely. You see, the former is actually a bondage. It's a bondage to the law. And so what Paul says, you are enslaving yourself once again to the law. You are going back to something that never was going to bring you relief in the first place. The purpose of the law of God is to point out that we are in need of a Savior. And so the key to godliness is not, okay, let me get my list of things I need to do today. I'm going to knock these out, and I'm going to be godly. The key to godliness is to humbly and meekly follow after the Spirit of God. It's freedom from the law. 
You will not find godliness by depending on living by the law. In fact, Paul says this much in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ. Did you hear it? In order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. There's no wiggle room here. You're justified by faith in Christ. That's it. The, the freedom that we have in, in the book of Galatians is to know that everything has been accomplished in Christ. Now, there's a danger here that we would say, because Christ has done everything, I need to do nothing. Because Christ has done it and he has accomplished everything, I can just sit back. The Ten Commandments, you know what, those are, those are good. I'll try to accommodate them when I can, but uh, I know that God is going to be gracious to me and he's going to forgive me. Well, Paul also has something to say about that. He says, should we then go on sinning so that grace may abound? No, by no means. You see, here's the reality. God has given us grace to grow in Christ Jesus, nowhere else. He, he doesn't give us grace by, uh, 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 by obeying the law. The law does not bring about justification or sanctification because we cannot keep it completely and perfectly. And so God gives us grace that we're no longer under the impossible law of obedience to the justified. And yet, and yet, because we have been redeemed, because our hearts have been transformed, we have desires according to the Spirit, not just according to the sinful nature, not just according to the flesh. Grace is greater than our sin. This is a glorious grace. This is a wonderful grace. This is the grace that is the key to godliness. The key to godliness is not how many steps have you taken on the right path today. The key to godliness is who is your Savior? And how are you rejoicing in him? Even that can be mistaken as a work. Even that can be a work that you just say, well, I just have to rejoice in Christ a little bit more today. No, stop it. The key is Christ and his grace, not your work. Stop making it about you, Paul says to the Galatians. The Spirit of God calls to us the same this morning. Stop making it about you whether it's you figure it out and you've got to show it to somebody else or you have to hold somebody else's feet to the fire. No. Point to Christ. Glorify him. Lift up the name of Christ. Praise his name for what he has done, what he has accomplished. Focus wholly on him. This is the grace that we have been given, that we are not looking at uh, ourselves in the light to say, this is what I've accomplished. But to say, how great is God for how wonderful he has been to me in being gracious to me, for I am a sinner and have been shown grace. I am a sinner, deserving of God's wrath, but I have been given everything, even an inheritance from Christ, my Savior. This is our rejoicing. This is our praise. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your great grace. We ask that you would help us to engage in the battle of what Satan would be encountering us with, the self-righteousness and pride that we would hold on to. Father, we pray that you would grow in us the love of Christ. That we would see in our midst the fruit of the Spirit be exhibited, not because we have determined to do so, not because we have checked boxes, that we have pursued the law, but because we are walking with the Spirit, focusing on Christ, humbly coming after our gracious and great Lord and Savior. Father, would you do this in our midst? that you would receive the glory and honor for it. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.